Kristen Acheson here, and we're talking about the motivation and emotion chapter, and this is our lecture on the theories of motivation. So motivation is that need or desire that energizes and directs our behavior, right? So that's kind of our the reason why we do something. Um, and again, it could be a number of different things. And this is because it arises from this combination of both nature and nurture. So it's based on both our biological and physiological needs, but it's also based on our learning environment and what we know about our culture and our environment. There's three different ways that we're going to talk about these motivated behaviors. Um, we're going to talk about drive reduction theory, we're going to talk about arousal theory, and then we're going to talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So the first theory that we're talking about is this drive reduction theory. And this is the idea that physiological needs really arouse us and motivate us to satisfy a need. So this theory has some assumptions. It has an assumption that we have physiological needs. And we all know this, right? We need to eat. We need to drink. Um, these are needs. These are physiological needs that need to be met. If a need's not met, the theory says, it creates a drive to meet that need, to meet that, um, to fill that desire. And this pushes us to act um, so that we can reduce this physiological need. We can also have strong drives result from an incentive as well. Um, so we both have that need and an incentive to act um, to really push this behavior towards the need. Part of this comes out of the idea that we're trying to be in a level of homeostasis. Homeostasis is that nice middle area where you're comfortable. You're not too full, you're not too hungry. Um, you're not too hot, you're not too cold. Um, homeostasis is that idea that you're in a comfortable state, um, that you don't have um, too much arousal, too much drive, and you don't have too little. So, for example, um, if we're thirsty, if we haven't had anything to drink, um, that need, that physiological need for water um, will drive us to have, to be thirsty, and then we'll have um, a drive-reducing behavior, which would be drinking in this case. And these can be any number of things. We can talk about eating, we can talk about sexual behaviors, um, all of these kinds of things um, we're doing to get into this kind of body's normal state of comfort, um, where you're not hungry, where you're not thirsty, um, where you're not craving some physiological need. The next one we're going to talk about is arousal theory. Arousal theory is, is kind of similar um, to this drive reduction theory. You can think about the drive reduction theory really easily within this arousal theory model um, because it's going to have some of those similar ideas of homeostasis, of being in this comfortable level. But instead of it focusing on physiological needs, it's going to focus on arousal. And so it describes the search for the right, that comfortable arousal, arousal level that energizes and directs behavior. So again, it's both of these two theories are looking at this kind of comfortable state. Um, one is, again, um, the drive reduction theory is going to focus more on these physiological needs, um, where arousal theory um, is a little bit more complex because it can, incre it can include other behaviors that aren't as overtly physiological. So this theory says that some of these behaviors increase rather than decrease arousal. One of these may be an example of curiosity. Um, so curiosity actually can increase our arousal um, rather than decreasing it, where drive reduction theory is always about kind of decreasing that and getting back to that normal level. Um, um, arousal theory talks about it kind of as a plus and a minus system a little bit more. So for example, um, arousal theory says that, again, we're, main, we're motivated to maintain this optimal level of arousal, this comfortable state um, that's neither too high nor too low. Um, we've all been in that state where we're overexcited and it feels uncomfortable. We've all been in that state where we're underexcited and it feels uncomfortable. Um, so again, arousal theory is talking about this optimal point, which is again similar to that idea of homeostasis. Not the same, but similar way to think about it. So for example, 
Um, if we have a low arousal state, which feels like boredom, that's uncomfortable, um, there's a motivation for stimulation. We're going to go and do something. We're going to play on our phone. We're going to get on the computer. We're going to go talk to somebody. We're going to go do something. We're going to go for a walk. Um, whatever can kind of stimulate us to get us back to that comfortable level of stimulation. Now we can have this opposite too. We can have a situation where we have high arousal, where we're overstimulated. And so we take ourselves out of that situation. We take ourselves out of the busy party and we take ourselves out of busy traffic. Um, we go to a quiet place um, to kind of get ourselves back to that comfortable level. Now, optimal arousal really varies depending on the kind of task that we're being performed. If we're doing something very difficult, um, if you're taking a test or you're working on a hard math problem or you're doing something difficult, um, you don't want to be in a busy, noisy room to do that. You don't go to the, uh, the club to do your homework <laughs> um, because when you're doing a difficult task, you want low arousal because that task itself is providing some arousal. However, when you're doing an easy task, um, you can do those easy tasks under high levels of arousal. Um, so we see this optimal arousal really varies on the kind of task that's being performed. So our performance level on difficult tasks is much, much better in a low arousal state. However, for an easy task, and this is what this graph is telling us, our optimal performance um, is which a much higher arousal. Um, when we're doing an easy task and we're bored, um, we're not going to necessarily do a great job of that easy task. Um, but if we're doing an easy task and there are other things going around and our arousal level is higher, you know, then we will perform better. Um, that's again not saying that regardless either kind of homework if it's easy or hard you should be doing it at a at a club that's probably not going to work out well for anybody um but again this is this idea that again we're trying to be in this comfortable state if it's a really easy task it's not providing much arousal for itself and so we're still under we're still kind of under our baseline of comfortable arousal level um with a difficult task, it is providing a lot of arousal. And so we don't need um, other um, kind of stimulants um, to kind of arouse us to be able to perform these tasks well. So again, both the arousal theory and the drive direction, reduction theory are kind of, um, you can think about them as kind of balancing acts. Um, one of the, which um, in the drive reduction, we're balancing more physiological needs. Um, and in the arousal theory, we're more looking at um, our, how we're psychologically feeling, how we feel aroused. Um, um, so again, both of these are kind of balancing acts and they're about maintaining this level of comfort um, for this kind of optimal performance and this, um, this uh, benefit for the individual. The third theory that we're going to talk about is different. Um, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And what he says is certain needs have priorities over others. Here is his hierarchy of needs, and it's got this pyramid shape. And what Maslow says is that you got to take care of the base first before you can worry about these other things. So he's, his theory says in terms of motivation, um, the, our primary motivations are going to be based on these physiological needs. After, and that includes, again, these hunger, thirst, these sorts of things. After that, we're going to have safety needs, um, following by this belongingness and love needs, this need to be accepted, um, to avoid um, what we'll talk about in the need to belong lecture, about loneliness and alienation and ostracization, um, to avoid that. Then we have esteem needs. And this is to feel good about ourselves, to feel competent, to feel independent, to get recognition and respect from others. And finally, we'll have self-actualization needs. And this is living up to one's full potential. Um, we'll talk about Maslow a little bit more when we get to the personality chapter. Um, and we'll talk about this kind of this humanistic view of um, psychology. But what Maslow's theory says is if you haven't met your physiological needs, you don't care if you're not living up to your full potential. You don't care if you're not, um, you're not worried about your self-esteem if you're hungry um, is what um, this hierarchy of needs says. Now, of course, there's, there's differences in this, and we can see some exceptions made for this. Um, when things like hunger strikes and things like that, you could see where a physiological need's not being met um, for a higher need. But those are kind of more exceptions than they are um, the rule. 
So again, we're not going to be worried about um, finding a, a partner or finding um, friends um, if we're living in an unsafe, unpredictable um dangerous environment. We're going to be worried about staying alive. Um, so again, Maslow is saying that there's these hierarchy of needs and all of these motivate behavior and all of these are behind motivation, but there's a, there's an order in which they go. So all of these things can dictate behavior. All of these things can be motivation for behavior, according to Maslow. He's just saying that there's an order in which they're ranked, um, that our more basic needs need to be met first before we can do these higher order needs, such as esteem and self-actualization. Okay, well that ends our lecture about um, theories of motivation. Thanks.